Good morning, and welcome to La Mirada Foursquare Church, a place where we worship and glorify the Lord. We lift up our hands and we lift up our voices, a place where you're free to do what you want, even jump. Hallelujah. Praise God. God is good. And the Lord has made this day that we can come here and worship the Lord without nobody interrupting us. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let us pray today for our veterans, for the ones that fought for us, the ones that are in the service now. We thank you. We let's pray for their protection. Let's pray for the parents that lost their kids in Texas. That the Lord will bless them and comfort them. Let's open up and pray. Dear Heavenly Father God. How great thou art, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord God. That's why we come here, Lord Jesus, to listen to your word, to sing songs to you, Lord God, that it will be a sweet aroma unto your nostrils, dear Heavenly Father. We were here, Lord, because of you. Father God, thank you for our veterans, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the ones that made it, Lord God, with their protection over them. Lord, thank you for the ones that just passed, Lord God, but they fought to keep us free, Lord Jesus. You're free to worship you right now, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Be with their families. And Father, be with the families that lost their kids in Texas, Lord. We can feel the hurt, Lord God, what they went through, Lord. But these kids are yours, dear Heavenly Father. And we just ask, Lord God, that you just comfort them, Lord Jesus. Embrace them, Lord God, because you were suffered for not the kids to come unto me. You got these 19 kids that are with me, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for this day, Lord God. Thank you that we can glorify you and lift your name on high. For it's worthy, you're worthy to be praised, Lord God. Worthy to be lifted, Lord Jesus God. Worthy to be jumping up and down in your name, Lord God. And Father God, be with our worship team this morning as they bring forth music, Lord. Music that we can worship you, Lord God. Lift our names, our hands, Lord God. And lift our voices to you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Father God, anoint our pastor as he brings forth the message. Lord God, anoint him, Lord God. And again, let us rejoice as we listen to his word. Again, thank you for this day that you made. We exalt you and praise your name, Jesus Christ. We all said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord.
I just want to praise you. I just want to 
spirit that rose Jesus from the grave is here in this place. That same spirit is in us. Thank you, God, that we can call on you in our times of need. There are so many things, so many things in this world, so many tragedies that are happening, so many things that can down, burden us. Seems like there's no answer there. Seems like everyone wants to figure out the answer, but the answer comes from you, God. Calling on you is where the peace will come, where the hope will come, where the love will come, where the answers will come, where the true healing comes comes from you, Jesus. We thank you, God, that you fight for us. We thank you, God, that when it seems impossible, that we can call on you. We can call on you and that you are with us. We have your word that we can speak. Your words that are truth. Your words that are more powerful than any circumstance that we face your presence that gives us hope, your presence that gives us peace beyond understanding, your presence that gives us the perfect love that casts out all fear. We don't have to worry because you are with us and we can trust that you fight for us and that you never leave us, and that you never forsake us. May we rest in that truth today that when it looks like it's impossible, when it looks like we're surrounded, that we are surrounded by you. That you are in control, that you know the beginning from the end. So we can trust that you will work everything out for your good. Because we are called according to your purpose. We trust that you hold everything together. We trust that you know what we need and that we trust that you will make a way and that everything will turn out to glorify you in the end. We love you. We, we love you, Jesus. And we give you all of the praise, all of the honor, and all of the glory today. As always, it is a, a, a privilege to be able to share the word of God with you. It is by his grace and his grace alone that allows me to be up here to share it with you. Nothing that I've done or nothing that I've earned or merited. It is just by his divine hand. And I always read out of 1 Peter 4.11, which reads, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. And if anyone serves, let him serve by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, as I was just struggling, really, as to what I was going to share today, it was, for me, it was a kind of a struggle, or it just didn't come easy. A and the reason being is because of all the things that are happening. I just back in April of this year, there was a mass shooting in Sacramento, and six people were killed and 12 were wounded. And then just this month alone, we had the mass shooting at, at a grocery store in Buffalo, New York, where 
10 were killed and three were wounded. And then even here in uh, California, uh, Southern California, there was a shooting at a church in Orange County. I mean, one man was killed and five wounded. And then we have what we had happened recently is a mass shooting at an elementary school in Texas. Killed 19 children and two teachers and over a, a dozen wounded. And it just serves as a reminder that where, you know, some politicians label it as hate, it's more than just hate. It is evil. And what we're finding is that no community is immune to evil. And that evil is pervasive. It, 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 it just seems to be just dominating the airwaves. Tragedy, tragedy in people's lives will never be the same. You go to a grocery store, to a church, or to town, town, or you drop your children off at Ella at school, and then their lives are never, ever the same. Never, ever the same. And then I'm reminded of what it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, where it reads, it says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness, in the heavenly supernatural places. So it reminds us that there is, there is an evil that is at work that is spiritual. It is demonic in nature. And we can see that it is influencing everything that we are looking at on the news, that the, the, these, the, this spiritual wickedness is impacting the culture, whether we acknowledge it or not. We may say, well, it doesn't exist, but all we have to do is look at what we are seeing to recognize that there is a spiritual wickedness that is at work here. When Jesus is speaking, he says this in, in uh, John chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. He says, I am the door. Anyone who enters through me will be saved and will live forever. This is et talking about eternity. And will go in and out freely and find pasture. That means spiritual security. Then he contrasts it. The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. And so what he's doing is he, he's contrasting. He says, Jesus brings life. Jesus brings life eternal. The enemy or the thief who's working at odds has a different agenda. The, th the thief's agenda is to steal, to bring about death and destruction. That's his agenda. And we see the manifestation on it every time we turn on the news. What do we see? We see death and destruction. People's lives are stolen from them. And that is an indicator of the spiritual forces that are at work, even though we don't see them. And I was, as I was meditating on this, I was drawn to Job. And I just want to do some quick observations from Job. And this is out of what I would call the, the book of Ralph, all right? And just some observations that I would like to look at as we talk about, see this, the spiritual at work, how it impacts everything. Now, this is Job chapter 1, starting with verse 1. It says, in the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was, was I underline, was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. 
He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. So not only was he, did he serve God, but he was well off. He was rich. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And look what it says. This was Job's regular custom to bring his children before the Lord. Now I'm thinking also, Job's wife saw this. Job's wife saw this man who served God, who offered sacrifices to the Lord on a regular basis for their children. It wasn't just his children. It was for their children. And she's seeing this, this man who's living uprightly, this man who is, serve, who is coming before the Lord with his children. And she's observing this, this man who was blameless and upright and feared God and shunned evil. This is what she saw. Now, then we have what this, this drama unfolding in the heavens between God and, and Satan. And that in and of itself is a study. But I want to jump right down to uh, chapter 10 of Job 1, in which Job is, in which, uh, Job is the subject and Satan is uh, bringing Job, is uh, coming to the Lord about Job. And this is what he says to the Lord. He said, you, but have you put a hedge of protection around him, talking about Job, and his house, and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the works of his hands and conferred prosperity and happiness upon him. And his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch and destroy all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Once again, look at what he says. What, what, what is Satan's objective? His objective is for Job to curse God to his face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that Job has is in your power. Only do not put your hand on the man himself. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Now what was again Satan's objective? Is to get Job to curse the Lord. That's he says, I will take away all of this and he will curse you. So Satan's at work and Remember what the, what, what the enemy does. What does the thief come? He comes, what, to steal, kill, and destroy. And so we see what's happening in Job's life is being influenced by the spiritual. Everything that happened, he lost his property, he lost his servants, he lost his children. All of this happened. And where did it start? In the spirit. In the spirit. Now after all of this, Job uh, 1, 20 and 22, 20 through 22. Then after he lost you know, everything, then Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head in mourning for the children. And he fell to the ground and worshiped God. He said, naked, without possessions, I came into this world from my mother's womb, and naked I will return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Now, I want to go back to Job's wife. Job is seeing, and Job's wife is seeing him, what, living blameless? sacrificing for their children, trying to live his best life possible. 
and his wife is seeing that. And now he says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. So the Lord, for, so, so she hears, the Lord gave us these children, and now the Lord has taken away these children. Now this is a mother. She's lost her babies. She's lost her children, and she's looking at, I'm thinking she's looking at the life of her husband and seeing that he's doing the best that he knows how to do, and the Lord took away her children took them away. He gave them to me, and now he took them. This is her response. Job 2.9. Then his wife said to him, do you still cling to your integrity and your faith and trust in God without blaming him? What does she say after that? Curse God and Curse God and die. I believe she's responding out of her grief. She is so devastated because she knows that her life will never be the same. And I think, this is just me, that in her grief, I think she was demonically influenced. Why do, why do I say that? What was Satan's ob objective when he presented this thing before the Lord? What was his objective? What did he want to do? He wanted Job to curse God. And then all of a sudden, what is his wife asking him to do? Curse God. She may not have known it because she, she's, she's in grief. She's, she's, she's lost her children. And as a result, unknowingly, she says, curse God, which is exactly what the enemy wanted Job to do. I think what happens is this. Sometimes we, would, we can have the best intentions. We can, and things happen, and we say things that I think they may be demonically influenced. Why, why would I say that? We, we look at Peter. Peter was, you know, the Lord was, Jesus was telling Peter, I know, I've got to suffer and die, but I'll come back. And what did Peter do? He took the Lord aside and said, yeah, Lord, far be it. And what did Jesus do? He said, Satan, get thee behind me. So here is this man who loved, who's following Jesus, this man who's casting out the devil, and what happens? He's being demonically influenced, even though he doesn't know it. Things that are coming out of his mouth that he, that he, he thought, I, 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 this is because I'm concerned. But Jesus recognized the spiritual influence that was behind what he said. And he direct, dealt directly with the spirit because it came from, there was a spiritual source behind it. He didn't rebuke Peter. He rebuked the spirit that was behind it, that influenced him. Even though he was a man of God, even though he cast out demons, even though he healed the sick, there was a spirit that influenced him. And if you, you think that we're not immune to it, how many have ever been in arguments with their wife or husband and said things that could come out your mouth and you're going like, going, whoa, where did that come from? We say things you know, just in the heat of the moment that tear down and hurt and, and, and break them down and we, 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 we regret it. Who's to say that we weren't demonically influenced in that moment? And that's what came out of our mouth. Well, I'm not saying that we were demon-possessed. I'm not talking about Annabelle or, or, or the exorcist. I'm talking about something that was just influenced, that thought that says, maybe you need to put him in the check him or put her in her place. And we say something, and we look at it, and we say, oh, my goodness. But it was demonically influenced. So this is what I'm saying is that sometimes we don't know it. We have people who are cursing prayer, and, but I think it is because of their anger and their hurt and their grief, and I believe that maybe that they're being influenced demonically and they don't even know it. This is why we have to be discerning because it is a spirit, it is, it is something at, at its very core, it is spiritual. 
2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4 says this. Even if our gospel is in some sense hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only to those who are perishing. Among them, what does it say? The God of this world, Satan, has blinded their minds of the unbelieving to prevent them from seeing the illuminating light of the gospel of the glory of God, who is the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So who's blinding them? The devil. And what is his purpose? So that they will not see the light. They will not, they will not come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Where is the source? Where does it start from? The spirit. So it says the God of this world is trying to influence them. And so I think that the evil that we're seeing is being influenced demonically. And if, if the devil can, de can deceive us to believe that, we, that he doesn't exist, that maybe this spiritual evil and the demonic is some idea of a primitive philosophy, what effective strategy do we have against him? If we, don't, if we don't look at it and say, well, that's something they may believe in some third world country, like you know, maybe in Africa they might believe in demons and all that sort of, but we don't believe that in the United States. And if that's the case, what weapon do we have to deal with the spiritual evil that is happening? Even though we see the manifestation of it, if we dismiss it, if we kind of like relegate it to, well, all right, that's just the society, we don't deal with the root issue, and the root issue is that there is a spiritual wickedness that is at work in the culture that is at work in the society. And we know we, and in our technological advances that may dismiss this concept of the demonic, and if we change our laws, and in changing those laws, are we really dealing with the demonic, demonic forces that are at work? We could change the laws all that we want. Is it dealing with the demonic forces? Is it having an impact on the demonic? No. It doesn't. It doesn't. We can change all the laws that we can, but there is a heart issue, and there is something happening in the, in behind the scenes that we do not know, and unless we recognize it, we'll be ineffective in how we deal with it. And you may say, well, that's, that's kind of extreme, Pat. Well, then we have to, Jesus spoke to the demonic all the time. They would come up to him and, and, and bow at his feet and say, it's not our time. He'd call out their name. He was dealing with this all the time. And just because we live in a technological society or what we consider a, 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 an advanced society does not negate the demonic happening in people's lives. This is what we have to be aware of. But how do we deal with it? What, what do we do? That, that song, you know, it, uh, it's kind of like, you know, the weapons that we have, how do we do it? Second Chronicles, this famous passage of scripture says this. Second Chronicles 7.14. It says, if my people, well, whose people? My people. That's you and me. Who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. This is what he is talking about. And we sometimes get it all confused in the sense that, all right, then we might be, you know, rebuking Pokemon and Harry Potter on the front door. But in the back door, the enemy's coming in through division and strife and having the same effect. Because he says, where division and strife, there is every evil work. So we have to be diligent in our spiritual perseverance. James 4, starting with verse 7 out of the Amplified. It says, so, sub so submit to what? The authority of God. Resist the devil, stand firm against him, and he will flee from you. Come close to God with a contrite heart, and he will Come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your unfaithful hearts. 
you double-minded people. Be miserable and grieve and weep over your sin. Let your foolish laughter be turned to mourning and your reckless joy to gloom. Humble yourselves with an attitude of what? Repentance and insignificance in the presence of the Lord. And what does it say? He will exalt you. He will lift you up. He will give you purpose. But the thing about it is that if, unless, without submitting to God, you cannot resist the devil. They go hand in hand. In other words, without the word of God, without you cannot, you can't do anything. Without the scriptures, you cannot stand against the devil. Without the, Jesus Christ, we have no authority over the devil. But it is contingent on what? Us humbling ourselves before the Lord with an attitude of repentance. That we're not all that in a bag of trips. Our, our, Sometimes we say, I'm a hot mess, and I need to recognize that I'm a hot mess. And the only reason that I'm worthy is because of what Jesus Christ has done. We have no authority in the spirit unless we have Jesus. We may be able to do certain things, but we don't have any influence in the spiritual realm. And when we try to deal with the demonic and we don't have Jesus, well, it could go the wrong way. And we're going to look at what happens uh, at Acts chapter 19. This is out of the Amplified, starting with verse 13. It says, now then some of the traveling Jewish exorcists also attempted to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I implore you and solemnly command you that by, band you by the name, by, by the Jesus whom Paul preaches, seven sons of one named Siva, a Jewish priest. Not just a Jewish priest, a Jewish chief priest. He was a chief priest for doing this. Now what was happening is that this was happening in the, in the city of Ephesus. And the, in Ephesus, it was just an intermingling of faiths that was, that was happening there. Uh, they, that city was dedicated to the, the goddess uh, Artemis. And they worshiped all type of you know, gods there. And this, in other words, spirituality was a brisk business in magical goods and spiritual consultations and soothsayers, supernatural, even supernatural healing. And that includes exorcism. This was all happening. And now these, these, these sons of this, this chief priest, were, I believe they were using the high name of their father to garner some legitimacy as exorcists. They said they're, they were the chief priest. But what they were saying, they said, I implore you and solemnly command you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. They did not have a personal relationship with him. They just said, well, let's just throw out, let, let, well, JC and the boys, I'm just going to throw it out there like that. And I believe that they thought maybe their father's influence as a, the, as a chief priest had some clout with the spiritual. Otherwise, they would not have mentioned that he was a chief priest. So the, the text says they were exorcists. And I'm thinking that this is just me, that maybe they were practicing exorcism, but it might have been a sham. But now they're about to deal with the real thing. They're about to deal with the spiritual. And look at what it says in verse 15. But the evil what? Spirit retorted. I know and recognize and acknowledge Jesus. And I know about Paul. But as for you, who are you? Oh, my goodness. He didn't even know. See, the demons need to know who you are. They, did, they didn't know who they were. They, did, they didn't even they didn't, well, Then the man in whom, in whom was the evil spirit leapt on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them. I mean, he was beating seven men. He was, beat, he, he was pulling out some Bruce Lee stuff, I'm probably thinking right there. <laughs> and, and what happened? And so they ran out that house in terror, stripped, naked, and wounded. That's a beating. That's a beating. You beat somebody naked? <laughs> 
That, that, that just doesn't happen. You got to rip off their clothes and beat them down. See, if I was there and I saw that happen, I would, my, six, my, my six brothers would have been by themselves because once I saw my first brother get beat down, I said, I'm out of here, dude. <laughs> I'm heading out the back door. I see what happened to him. I'm just, but what was happening there, they thought that their influence had an impact on the spiritual, that, 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 that maybe their father's position at high priest, it, it really carried no influence at all. It carried no impact in the things of the spirit. So that, that tells me that no amount of money, no laws passed by man can effectively deal with the demonic. It can't because it's not dealing with the source. Man's law can maybe deal with maybe behavior, but not the spiritual. Man's law maybe it can even influence behavior, but they can't influence the spiritual. And the, but also on the upside of this, man's laws cannot contain the spirit of God. Just as man's law have no influence on the demonic, man's laws has no influence on the most high God. So no matter what, no matter what type of what you're doing, no matter whatever lockdown, restrictions, or social distancing, none of that can contain the power of the most high God. And we have to recognize that, that there are countries where they cannot, it is illegal for them to meet. And you know in those countries, the spirit of God is moving in a mighty way. That no matter what man does, it cannot contain the power of the Holy Spirit. Man's law has no impact in that. Second Corinthians, famous passage of scripture. Second Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5. It says, the weapons of all warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood. Our weapons are divinely powerful for what? The destruction of fortresses, strongholds. We are destroying sophisticated arguments and every exalted and, pry and proud thing that sets itself against the true knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ. Where is, where is this happening? Is this happening on a physical level? No, it must be dealt spiritually. And we just saw what some of our weapons are. Praising the Lord is one of our weapons. Praising the Lord. The word of God is one of our weapons. The blood of Jesus is one of our weapons. Those are the things that are effective to the tearing down of the strongholds. And are we tearing down literal strongholds? No, we're tearing down spiritual strongholds. That have what blinded people to the light of the glorious gospel. That is why if we're going to share the Lord with somebody, we need to be prayed up. We need to be prayed up because if we're not prayed up, we, 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 there's some, we might face some problems there. And, and we just can't go casually in there. I went to this church, West, West Adams Four Square Church. And we used to have the, on Saturday called this Day of Deliverance. And boy, they were, de they were, they, they were dealing with that all every Saturday. And uh, there was this, this group that came, and uh, they, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were prayed up. They were prayed up, and so they knew how to do it. But one day, the pastor came. Uh, he, he didn't usually participate. And they said he came and he tried to rebuke something. They said they jumped, they jumped on the pastor. They had the <laughs> because he wasn't prayed up. He was, see, you just can't take this casually. If we are dealing with the spiritual realm, the devil is not playing. He, he's not playing. He doesn't care what you might be going through. What he wants you to do is he wants you to turn, to turn you from the direction, the plan that God has for you. But our weapons of our warfare are what? Divinely powerful. They're empowered by what? God. I want to I want to get these scriptures to let you know. That they're they're kind of like, they're not, I'm taking them all out of context, but I want to tell a little story. Again, the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood. But our weapons are divinely powerful to the destruction of fortresses, strongholds. Okay, then. Proverbs 21, 22. It says, a wise man scales the city walls of the mighty and brings down the strongholds in which they trust. 
What is a stronghold in which they trust? Atheism. That's the, that's the stronghold in which they trust. What is a stronghold in which they trust? Evolution. That is a stronghold in which they trust. But what does God say? That the weapons of our warfare are mighty to what? The tearing down of those strongholds. He says a wise person can, can go to, a, this is a single person, can go to the walls of the mighty and bring down the strongholds in which they trust. Bring down the strongholds in which they find their identity. So if they find their identity in, 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 this, in this, what I would call sexual flu, fluidity, what we have the power is this, you can tear down that stronghold, but it's not going to be because of, because of what your reasoning is. It's going to be by what? A spiritual. It's going to be by the spirit. Why is that? Why are they able to do that? I've inserted Isaiah 25, 12, totally out of context, but I'm using it anyway. And this is the Lord speaking. They're talking about the Lord. He will bring down your fortified walls and lay them low. He will bring them down to the ground to the very dust. Who does it? The Lord. Second Chronicles 20 and 15. He says, and he said, listen carefully, all you people of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, the Lord says to you, be not afraid or dismayed by this great multitude. Oh, for the battle is not yours, but whose? God's. So what do we have? We have what? We have the name of Jesus. We have the word of God. We have the power of the Holy Spirit to impact the spiritual. He says it's not by might. It also says it's not by might, not by power, but what? By his spirit. So we have to understand that there is a spiritual force at work. And unless we recognize it, unless we do, we, unless we do battle with it, unless we wrestle with it, because that, that's where our wrestling takes place in the spirit that it's a time for us. We need to pray. We need to intercede because the strongholds are just not going to come down with just a few hook of the It's going to take a, a, a concerted effort of prayer and intercessions to break down the strongholds of the evil demonic forces that are trying to influence the culture. And unless the church can come together in that area of prayer and intercession to tear down those strongholds, to allow the Lord to come in and break them down because it is the one, he is the one who is going before us. He is the one who's doing the battle. And I guarantee you, when God goes to battle, it, the battle, is, the, the victory is guaranteed. It is guaranteed. But there's also, we have this hope. If we're looking at the, the spiritual there is this spiritual destiny that each and every one of us have as believers. For atheism, they offer no hope. In other words, when you die, that's it. That's it. But those who know Christ, we, we might grieve, but we grieve differently. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 and 14. Now, we do not want you to be uninformed believers about those who are asleep in death, so that you will not grieve for them as others who do not have hope beyond this present life. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, as in fact he did. Even so, God, in the same way, by raising them from the dead, will bring with him those believers who have fallen asleep in Jesus. See, there is this hope in God's divine sovereignty. We don't always get it. I don't always understand it myself. But when we grieve, there is a promise. That who've, uh, as our loved ones who might have gone before us, we will be reunited 
with him. That's the promise. That no matter what we might be going through, is it, it well, well, it, I, it, it may be look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. That his presence is with us. And there is this spiritual eternity that it is that hope that sees us through this evil time. It is knowing that God is with us and knowing that the, the, the spiritual knowing that there is an eternity with him that awaits us who know Christ. And there is this knowing, not just a hope, there is this knowing that we're going to be reunited with our loved ones for eternity. That's hope. So though we grieve, we don't grieve like the world grieves. And I want to close with this scripture. And this, is, this, is, this just solidifies you know, what, what, go, what, 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 what is happening. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conqueror through him who loved us. And he concludes with this. He says, for I am persuaded that neither death, what does he say? That neither death, that neither what? Death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities or powers. He's talking about demonic principalities and powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That is how we deal our, that is how we deal spiritually. We put our trust in his promises. And even during these evil times, it is that hope that we're going to be reunited. It is that hope that gets us through these difficult times. But we're encouraged, what? By his spirit. And if we're going to deal with these, these evil things that are happening, we're going to need to be empowered by his spirit. We're going to need the name of Jesus. How did Jesus, how did Jesus resist the enemy? With the word of God. There is no resisting the enemy without the word of God. There is no resisting the enemy without the power of God. There is no resisting the enemy unless we are submitted to God. All of that. But when we have that, we are what? More than conquerors. And we can never be separated from the love of God. And that when our time comes, and it will come for all of us, we're going to be reunited with him. That's why it says neither death or life can separate us from the love of God. And that is why Jesus died on the cross. That um, there is this, we are, unless we know Jesus, we are that spiritually walking dead. There is no connection. And yet Jesus paid it all by going to the cross, enduring, and, but he rose again. Jesus says this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's what it says. And so if you are watching me on Facebook or on YouTube and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there is an eternity. You have a choice to make. And there's only one way to be able to deal with the spiritual wickedness that is prevalent in the culture. And that is knowing Jesus Christ. Because it is through his shed blood, it is through that name, it is through the word of God that we can deal with the spiritual wickedness that is happening in the culture. And when we deal with that, if we, if we can pray with that, we, we, can, we can come out victorious. Um, our friend Marcus, Marcus back there, he, he shared with us at Bible study that there was, a, there was this, wicked, this wicked ruler 
And he said the churches came together and prayed. He said the churches, we, we, we got to do something about that. But they prayed, and they, you, they were united in prayer for this wicked ruler. And, and what happened, Marcus? Did, did, did he drop dead? He dropped dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like they went, but what did they do? They understood that there was a spiritual evil that was behind all of that. And they said the only way to deal with it is to be united in prayer. Be united with Christ. Because at every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Every knee. Every knee. So I want, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this prayer with me if you're watching me on Facebook or on YouTube and you have never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord. Pray this prayer with me. I recognize my need of the Savior. I believe that Jesus Christ died for the forgiveness of my sin. I confess my sins. I ask the Lord to forgive me of my sins. I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in my heart. God raised Jesus from the dead. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I ask to be filled with your precious Holy Spirit. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, it's the best decision you've ever made, ever made. And I want to pray with you. Heavenly Father, the only way to be able to deal with the evil, the spiritual evil that is prevalent in the society is to come to you that you go before us, that we fight our battles on our knees, and that you go before us, and that, Father, you lay low the strongholds in people's heart, that, Father, you would give us this desire to just come together and intercede and stand and resist the enemy. But we know that we have to submit ourselves to you. And in submitting ourselves to you, we, we have to admit that without you, we are lost. And we confess our sins. And we thank you that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And because we've been cleansed through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we can now approach your throne room boldly. Boldly because of what Christ has done. And that in Jesus' name, Father, we thank you that you've given us that name that is above every name that is named. And we take authority over the darkness that is trying to blind people, that is trying to keep them from the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And that you would go before us and shine your light in that darkness. And when your light shines, darkness must flee. Where your presence is, the enemy must flee. Where your spirit is, the enemy must flee. And we thank you that you give us the strength to resist and persevere. But, Father, we do it with all humility, knowing that it is not by, through us, but it is by you. We give you thanks, and we give you praise, and we give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you don't have a church home, I'd like to invite you to La Mirada Four Square Church. I, 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 still, uh, I, I still love this church after you know, seven years. I've still been on a seven-year honeymoon. It is just good people, good place where you know, your roots can grow. And um, the people here, they, they love the Lord, and they love the people. So I would invite you. But if you can't make it here, find a church. I would encourage you to go to church. Connect with fellow believers. Plant yourself that your roots might grow deep and that the fruit that is the spirit, that love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, and patience might manifest in abundance in your life. And I always conclude out of Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. It says, now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant 
even Jesus our Lord, equipped you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Amen. Don't miss Kimberly. Try me now and see, see if I can be completely yours. Amen? Amen. 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 That's the sentiment that comes to my heart after such a beautiful message. Thank you, Pastor, for teaching us so well. We just thank God for his goodness, for his mercy, and for his unfailing compassion. Um, I'm coming to you to bring you the announcements for this week of May the 15th. There will be no... On Monday, oh, I'm sorry, not the, not uh, May the 15th, it was May the 29th, <laughs> May the 29th. <laughs> um, there will be no prayer on, uh, on Monday in observance of uh, Memorial Day, but we will have prayer on Wednesday morning from 6 a.m. until. There will be Bible study this week starting at 7 p.m. with Pastor Bob, amen? Amen. And there will be Spanish service uh, this evening at 5 p.m. with yours truly. I'll be here uh, doing our Spanish service. We invite you to come on out and fellowship with us. Amen. Amen. Um, and there will be praise and worship night on Saturday, June the 9th, here at the La Mirada Four Square Church, starting at 6 p.m. See Pastor Tony for details. We're looking forward to a rich night of anointing fellowship, worship, and great music. Um, on Saturday, June the 5th, our neighbors, the Redeemer Church, will be having a rummage sale, a boutique sale, and we, uh, we're welcome, and we welcome you to come and join and participate. See Pastor Ralph for details. Um, there's that warning I have to give you. On um, uh, Saturday, June the 25th, there will be family game day. Yeah, see, it just all sounds like good and fun, right? Yeah? Okay. But you have to come at your own risk because these people are serious when they come to play these games. Uh, I've heard that family ties can be broken, you know, <laughs> and they take no prisoners. So if you want an exciting time of playing games and just having a lot of fun, a lot of fun, a lot of fun at your own risk, come on out. Uh, we welcome you. We'll have a really good time. It starts about 11 o'clock in the morning to about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And then on Saturday, June the 5th, from uh, 7 a.m. to 1 p.m., there will be prayer and fasting. Come and join Pastor Sam and Amanda. They'll be here praying uh, for the salvation of the lost, praying for our families. Um, and we just want to see the power of God move mightily. So come on out and join us. Uh, we pray for you. We're glad that you joined us today. We pray that God will bless your family, that he will keep you, that he'll bring protection and healing and comfort. Pastor listed a number of uh, the tragic uh, shootings and deaths that have gone on. There's so many more that go on across our nation in Chicago and Portland, all these different places where many, many people have experienced tragedy. But we serve a great God, a God of comfort. A uh, God of power, a God of healing, and we are his instruments of that healing. So we invite you just to surrender to God and allow God to use you uh, to minister his grace and his goodness. God bless you. Father God, we thank you uh, so much for your goodness. Oh, uh, we want to say that uh, this at this time we have um, an area that everybody can participate in. You that are in digital land, you can join us um, as well because it is offering time. Woo! This is our time when we, when we say to God, thank you. Thank you, God, because you have given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You, you bless us with your exceedingly great and precious promises. You provide all of our needs. We want to say thank you, and we want to let you know that we trust you 
with what you put in our hands, so we give some of it back to you. So let's honor God. Amen. Pastor Bob is coming uh, to receive our offering. Those of you that are in, um, in the digital world, you can join us uh, by sending your, um, your offering uh, here to the church. You can do it through Zelle uh, to bring that offering before God. So we just thank God for his goodness, for his loving kindness, and his tender mercies. Father God, we thank you so much. This is the day that you have made, and in this day, oh, how you have blessed us. We woke up this morning, Father. We woke up, and you started us on our way. So we thank you for meeting us here. We thank you for meeting us at every point of need in our lives. God, we pray that you will go before us as you always do and prepare the way. Help us to be sensitive to the leading of your spirit because you said that the steps of the righteous are ordered by you. So, God, you've already laid out the steps for our lives. So we pray that you will minister to us, that you will minister through us. And uh, we're grateful for all of your many blessings. We love you. We lift you up. We magnify your name, God. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Go and be blessed in the name of the Lord. Amen.